Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, Western University Vegan Society's first speaker event of this semester. Uh, my name is Drishti and I'm the current president of this club. So today you'll get to learn about the current state of our environment and how our diet comes into play. As with all of our events, it doesn't matter if you're a vegan as of yet, just that you come with an open mind. And so today the person who will be sharing their vast knowledge in this area is Dr. Tushar Mehta. Dr. Mehta studied at McMaster University, then completed medical school and residency at U of T. Currently he practices emergency med, but he's also spent many years um, practicing family medicine and addictions medicine. He also participates in international health projects, having volunteered on a yearly basis in rural India and now doing some work in Haiti. More pertinent to veganism, Dr. Mehta, along with a small team, founded Plant-Based Data. Um, the website for it is www.plantbaseddata.org. Essentially, it's an online database which collects and organizes the most important academic and institutional literature regarding the impact of um, plant-based diet on health, environment, and food security, including the role of animal agriculture in creating pandemics. Lastly, as for the structure of the, of the event, I just wanna say that if you guys have any questions throughout, there'll be some time at the end to ask them. So just hold on as well throughout this meeting, um, please mute yourself. And if you want to keep the video off, just so there's no interruptions um, with internet connection. Anyways, without further ado, here's Dr. Mehta. Thank you, Drishti. Let me share my screen. Okay. And hi, everyone. Uh, and thank you uh, for the invitation to come and talk. And I just want to, before I go too much further, I want to make sure I show you my uh, uh, University of uh, Western mug that I got during the last talk that I was there in person, actually. And, um, and hello to everyone again. So. This presentation is called Animal Agriculture and the Global Environmental Impact. So as we, as we mentioned, we're gonna speak about um, animal agriculture versus plant-based agriculture, plant-based foods. And I'm gonna time myself here to make sure I don't go over time as well. Um, and the environmental impact thereof, right? So shout out to, um, Wuvu and uh, and friends, because I understand some people may be here from other universities or outside the university as well. And all right, okay. So, and a little bit about myself. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, I do work in Haiti and I've done a lot of work in India as well as with some environmental organizations. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. All right. And okay, and this is my website, Plant Based Data, which I started this year. Uh, sorry, in 2020. And so it's fairly new. It's halfway through uh, 2020, we launched this website. And so I hope that people will use this as a reference to learn about plant-based diet and uh, all the different scientific implications thereof. All right. And I also work with an organization called the Well-Fed World based out of the United States. I'm on the board of directors there. And it's a fantastic organization. I hope you'll check that as well. So as we get started, let's take a look at our beautiful, beautiful planet, um, which is just amazing and incredible, all right? And what we're going to, um, you know, when we zoom in on our planet, we see that there's a lot of problems, okay? For example, these fires that have been going on everywhere, none of these problems are new, okay? These are all problems that have been going on for a long time. During COVID, we have seen an exacerbation of many of these problems, like the burning of the Amazon and, and so forth. Now, our goals in this presentation is to look at the big picture about animal agriculture versus plant, plant foods and the environment, okay? Because too many times we look at these, uh, you know, we look at sort of small issues or partial issues in isolation from another, but we have to look at them together. And we have to understand that animal agriculture is, is um, not to be looked at alone, but it's to be looked at in conjunction with other ecological issues. And it's actually what I consider to be one of the top three ecological issues, uh, along with sort of the total um, amount of fossil fuels that we use, as well as uh, the global materials industry and other big issues such as population growth and whatnot. Okay. And this is a story of science and numbers that are meeting. So we're gonna go through the big pictures of these numbers. Now, let's look at some beautiful people. Everywhere you go 
you know, on this planet, you'll find beautiful, beautiful people. This is a place where I've worked in India, in rural India. And these are some really good friends of mine uh, that I've worked with in Haiti and uh, a village that I've been to. We're at a, a little school there where we did some seminars and workshops with people. Okay. And as we talk about people and, and agriculture, let's start with world population. Okay. So what does 1% growth look like when you're talking about uh, world population? Okay. Does it sound like a lot? And the, and the truth is, if you start with 7 billion people, that means you're adding a billion people to the planet if you have 1% growth every 10 to 12 years. As we get towards 8 billion people, that means 1% growth is going to add a billion people every 10 years. Okay. And the world population is going to be about 10 billion by 2050. 12 to 15 million, uh, according to the United Nations, there's a range of what it could be by the end of the century. All right. And that's at a 1% growth rate with slight decreases may reduce it to um, lower numbers. So there's high and low projections. And amongst this global population, uh, we have, um, we have, uh, um, uh, this is, this is pre-COVID, um, over 700 million people, nearly a billion people who are below the global poverty line and 113 million people suffering you know, severe food shortages, uh, 74 million people affected by conflict, 40 million modern slaves. These numbers have all become worse since COVID. Moderate poverty is defined as having uh, less than $7.5 per day per person in your household. Uh, and that's more than 4 billion people. Now, extreme poverty has, uh, the people fitting in that category has, has uh, increased by about 150 million people or more just during COVID. But the rich amongst the earth, the billionaires um, and multimillionaires and uh, these kind of people, people like even, you know, in many of us coming from that background, we have increased, you know, 82% of all new wealth goes to the global 1%. And remember, if you're making more than about 40,000 Canadian dollars per year per person in your family, so you can be a single person making $40,000 a year, you're part of the global 1%. So it doesn't take much by our standards to be part of the global 1%, okay? Because there are so many poor people. Again, think of the scale, think of the numbers and the proportions, and most people are not aware of that. Um, and these are difficult conversations to have because uh, people don't want to think about uh, uh, these inequ inequities and where they fit along that spectrum, okay? But we do have to have them with, with uh, respect and rational thinking, right? And when we look at these issues, uh, a theme that I talk about over and over again is that when we look at human issues or environmental issues or animal issues, they're not separate issues. They are part of one big issue and they are intertwined on so many levels. And this, when you, when you watch the presentation, you're gonna see some of that. You know, we're not gonna be able to make substantial progress on any one parameter without making uh, progress on the other two. You can't just help animals or humans or the environment alone. You have to kind of do them together. If you look at the world 10,000 years ago, humans as a species were less than 1% of the biomass of vertebrate animals uh, globally, okay? We were just one species out of thousands and thousands and thousands of species, okay? But now, today, humans make up about a third of the biomass of vertebrates on the, on the surface of the earth, not counting fish, but on the terrestrial, in terms of terrestrial vertebrates, including birds and mammals and lizards and all these kind of things. We're, we're about one third of the biomass and our livestock, the animals that we breed, okay, are about two thirds of the biomass. Now, this is according to um, a Canadian scientist, uh, Vaclav Smil, and he, he, he sort of calculates that, um, that uh, uh, terrestrial vertebrates other than human controlled are less than 1% of the biomass. There's more contemporary data that says, well, maybe they're about 4% of the biomass. And so we outweigh all the wild mammals and land vertebrates by about 25 to 100 times. It's within that range, okay, if you're looking at contemporary data. And if you just look at chickens on earth, just one species of birds, you know, so a few subtypes of chickens, but that one species of birds, which are created by humans, it's not a natural species, by the way, uh, outweighs all wild birds combined. That's you know, 15 to 20,000 species, depending on how they classify species, um, by three times, okay? So you have to appreciate the scale by which humans are controlling and altering the earth. 
And the wild uh, vertebrate animal populations um, and other populations have uh, declined. If you look between uh, 1970 to 2014, this is WWF data, uh, and the Royal Society of uh, Royal Zoological Society of London, when they do this research, um, they find that in that time period, animals have declined by, animal populations have declined by 60% while their human population has pretty much doubled during that, that time. And if you just take out to 2016, uh, 2017, we find a further decline, a further rapid decline. We are wiping out uh, non-human life on the planet. Most people don't realize this because we live in our personal sort of bubbles, okay? Now, if you look at terrestrial versus marine versus freshwater, there's different proportions. And if you look at, if you look at uh, different, um, I'm going to expand this uh, window here a little bit so you don't, you're not capturing everything. There we go. Um, if we look at um, different continents, the proportions are different too. So there's a lot of variations here, but the thing is that we're wiping out non-human life all over the earth. Now, the scale of changing the earth, 75% of land-based environments are altered by humans, okay? And two-thirds of the marine environment, three-quarters of all freshwater systems are now devoted to crop or livestock use, and we have a huge uh, increase in crop production since 1970, right? The world's biomass, which is mostly trees and other plant biomass, has been cut in half by humans. We have actually deforested half the earth currently. And we control one quarter of everything that grows on the planet by photosynthesis, by the sunlight. Agriculture occupies 40 to 50% of the non-frozen habitable surface of the earth. Okay, and we are increasing the number of trees that we cut every year as well. And what I call this is ecological genocide. We are wiping out non-human life on earth. And it's very difficult for people to picture this because again, we're, we're living in our cities or, or our worlds, our bubbles we're staying in, and we don't see the bigger picture, but this is really critical. Now let's start talking about where animal agriculture fits in. A principle that we all need to know is called the feed conversion ratio, okay? When an animal or a human eats something, it doesn't automatically just turn into uh, muscle mass. If I eat, you know, uh, 100 grams of protein today, that doesn't mean that my body absorbs every single um, uh, gram of that protein and builds it into my muscle. Okay, we absorb, let's say, all of it or most of it, and we process a lot of it. We actually burn some of the protein as calories. We use it for, we use them for enzymes, and our body is always recycling through proteins. And when we make urine, urine, uh, the urea is actually breakdown products from uh, amino acids. Okay. And so we're always cycling through protein and metabolizing protein. So now when we look at the most efficient feed conversion ratios th through the most efficient animals using factory farming, using in many cases, hormones or chemicals or antibiotics and, and every sort of trick that we can use to promote the growth of these animals, especially also uh, we have bred these animals, um, then we get these feed conversion ratios. So three, three to six kilograms of plant protein eaten by a chicken will make one kilogram of uh, protein in the form uh, that somebody may eat from the chicken's flesh, all right? Um, it's six to eight kilograms for pigs, 10 to 18 for cows and ruminant animals like goats and sheep, it's not as efficient. Um, three to four kilograms for, let's say, eggs and milk. They're uh, a long line um, of the efficiency of, of uh, chickens. And farmed fish, the most efficient fish, again, we can push to that limit. And insects as well, they go to that limit too, okay? So they're not so much more efficient than the other animals when you start growing them in a mass. If you grow one insect in the test tube, it'll be more efficient. But when you grow them as a mass, you lose efficiency and you sort of get to the level of chickens, all right? And when you start having organic uh, um, animals or free range animals, and you have these animals running around and burning calories or using more traditional breeds of animals, you lose efficiency, okay? And it takes a lot of feed to grow that. So if you're, you know, to grow that amount of chicken flesh, um, you know, you're, you're talking about 10 to 20 kilograms soybeans or corn, okay? And when you look at calories compared to protein, the efficiency is even less. So it's 10 calories of feed makes one calorie in chicken flesh. But I show the protein ones because people are more concerned about protein and we're giving the animal agriculture industry, we're showing the, their best numbers, okay? So we're making them look good, right? 
I'm going to give be generous to those guys in terms of uh, the data that I'm presenting. Now, uh, yeah, and grazing animals as well. Okay, when when animals are moving around, you're less efficient. Now, how to make an animal more efficient? Uh, we do genetic engineering uh, of these animals, and first form is breeding. We breed these animals. We've bred them for um, centuries, millennia, and we've bred them into be becoming more and more efficient at converting feed. That's why they're more efficient. And we've done very well over the past uh, uh, decades. And you can see a chicken from 1957, what a chicken looks like in 2005. We're sort of reaching a plateau where we can't get too much more efficient than we have. But that ch chicken in 2005 or the modern chicken right now grows very fast compared to the ones that are more traditional breeds and uh, has the highest feed conversion ratios. But they're very, very abnormal animals um, in terms of uh, their existence. They would never survive anywhere on their own. And um, not only that, but they, they suffer and they have a lot of health problems in their short, short life. Okay. Now, and we're also using gene modification too, so genetic engineering. But remember, breeding is a powerful form of genetic engineering. Now, in terms of the terrestrial livestock on the planet, there's 70 to 80 billion land animals slaughtered per year. That is, for scale, it's hard to think of what a billion is, but that's over 2,000 animals per second mostly chickens. And in terms of monogastric animals, that's chickens, pigs, and other birds, right? They eat grain, soy, oil seeds, and those kind of things, all right? Now, ruminants uh, are goats, cattles, cattle, uh, buffalo, cows, right? They can eat the same things as monogastrics, right? But they also consume, uh, they can also consume hay and silage and grass and so forth, and their process of rumination can digest these. So when it comes to uh, planetary land use, we mentioned those statistics already, but animal agriculture out of that 75%, we're using 75% of, uh, of, of the land, we've altered it, but a sheer 30 to 40% of the total uh, usable land on earth is dedicated to animal agriculture, okay? And it's somewhere there, it's probably somewhere closer to you know, 37, closer to the 40% side actually. 10 to 15% of the earth's surface is used for growing crops. But remember, 50% of those crops are used to feed animals. And only 5 to 10% of the earth's usable surface is crops for direct human consumption, probably around 6%, actually, according to um, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the better papers that we can look at. And remember that out of all the protein that is consumed by humans, 60% comes from plants. So that small portion of land that we use for growing plants provides the majority of our protein. And we look at grazing, grazing animals, which takes up a huge amount of land, it only provides like 1.2% of the world's protein. Okay, this is a very small amount. When we look at, this is old United Nations data. Um, and for a long time, we've known, you see that sort of orange column in the middle here. This is land used by different industries, the industries listed on the side here. Animal agriculture is the largest use of land by humans, okay? And that's known for a long time. We'll show some more data about this. And this is why uh, forest destruction and um, the destruction of wild habitat, habitats and biodiversity is so heavy by this industry. Okay, when we are destroying the Amazon uh, currently, the majority is because we're grazing uh, animals, we're destroying the forest to create pasture, or uh, destroying the forest to uh, create, uh, you know, soy production, animal feed for animals, uh, for, for livestock, okay? And that's the main cause, uh, you know, that's the main cause of Amazon destruction. And this is happening everywhere. This is happening to forests and land everywhere. Even in places where we're not engaging in new deforestation, the majority of land is still, that is used by humans is still used for animals. That is, that has in previous uh, uh, times been converted from uh, wild uh, ecosystems, okay? Natural ecosystems. So this, fundamental issue of decreased efficiency means you need more land and you need more water, you need more soil, pesticides, antibiotics, okay, to grow the same amount of food that could be done uh, using smaller uh, footprint uh, if you just had plant foods, okay. 
Again, here's our world of data. I hope you guys all know this website. And again, these are taking the our world and data uses United Nations um, um, uh, data for this slide over here. And the papers where it comes from, the United Nations specifically states that you know these are conservative numbers, right? Um, in terms of agricultural land and how much humans are using. But you can see again here that this this large amount of land used by animal agriculture provides only a small amount of the calories and protein that is utilized by humans. Okay. And when we change the land, we disrupt these ecosystems. Okay, So grazing and growing crops to feed animals, that combined uh, use of land is the largest cause of deforestation on the planet, biggest cause of rainforest loss, wetland loss as we drain wetlands to convert them into pasture, convert them into um, cropland to feed uh, livestock, uh, loss of natural grasslands. Okay, so when you're grazing animals on grasslands, those grasslands were different generally prior to grazing. Okay, and it's the biggest cause of biodiversity loss. And we're talking about the sixth mass extinction. This is one of the biggest drivers, perhaps the biggest driver of, of mass extinction because it's the biggest user of land and changing uh, uh, natural ecosystems. And factory farming, is actually much more efficient than grazing animals when it comes to cattle. Now, we'll talk about this. Um, this is an important topic right now because of the marketing of animal agriculture industry. Okay, um, we concentrate the animals and grow their feed on a much smaller footprint of land. And yes, there are worse issues regarding animal welfare and antibiotic resistance and all kinds of things. But generally speaking, it's much more efficient. You're using less land and has less environmental impact compared to grazing, which uses the most land, having a greater amount of biodiversity impact and a greater climate impact because methane is released from, from grazed animals, ruminants. They release more ethane, methane when they're grazing. Okay, soil erosion is a big problem here too because of the deforestation, wetland loss, compaction by hooves. Okay, um, animals eat grasses very low. If you're having a very, if you have a pasture with a very small number of animals, it probably isn't much of a problem. But most of the pastures on Earth, uh, they're trying to maximum the, maximize the number of animals that they're growing there, and therefore they can eat the grasses very low, and then you have more erosion. Uh, and uh, you get different uh, species um, that grow one after another after, because of grazing. And um, you get desertification in the worst cases of animal agriculture. Now, there are other factors for desertification as well, but uh, animal agriculture is one of the biggest. Okay? Now, remember, plow-based agriculture also has a, a bad impact on the soil, but 50% of all crops are fed to animals, and, if we were, and, and we lose that efficiency. So what we'd rather do is uh, grow plant-based foods on a smaller footprint and use better techniques that protect the soil. Now, uh, okay, so uh, yes, I think we covered this. The other things about uh, grazing animals, you still get this animal waste, which uh, from grazing can contaminate freshwater systems and people kill predators everywhere they go. Now, grazing uses uh, the largest amount of, of land from animal agriculture and, uh, and Everywhere you have grazing, people kill all the predators, which are going to hurt their animals. So that's another major ecosystem impact. Now, the meat and dairy industry are putting a lot of misinformation out there and talking about, oh, grass-fed beef and holistic grazing and uh, regenerative grazing. There's all these things, starting with this guy, Alan Sla Sa um, Savory. He's their poster boy who did this TED talk, which got millions of views and makes it sound so great that, oh, you graze animals and you store carbon in the ground, okay? And then you have the industry putting out these movies like Kiss the Ground and getting like vegans or former vegans, whatever Woody Harrelson is right now, I'm not sure, um, to narrate these films and tell these stories. Sacred Cow, they've written books and have you know, programs that they're teaching at universities. Very, very sophisticated and huge investment by the meat and dairy industry. Basically telling something that's not true, okay? That you can, um, you can uh, graze animals in a modified way and you can then store 
more carbon in the ground than uh, you're actually emitting from those animals. It can be like carbon negative beef. They advertise that kind of stuff. Now, um, this is not true. Okay, if, if you look at the science behind what they do, and it's very interesting that meat and dairy industry have hired scientists to write papers about this and publish their papers. But if you review what they're doing, this is a recent review by my, myself and uh, my colleague in plant-based data, Nicholas Carter, which we've published online. And we take apart a recent article and show what they're doing to sort of generate the numbers that they're getting. That they're essentially, you know, sort of gaming the system, trying to create numbers to show that, hey, we're, we're carbon negative, but it's actually not true, okay? Um, you can look at this article and, and, and see uh, one of the, um, see an analysis of a recent paper, essentially, okay? Um, so water use, animals use more water than plants on a per protein and per calorie basis, okay? And we can see how much of the world's um, crops and fresh water are used by uh, animal agriculture. And the fecal matter that comes from an excess fertilizer use from using animals eventually gets into water systems and you get eutrophication and a lot of damage to freshwater systems. The freshwater eventually drains to the ocean and you get eutrophication and dead zones in uh, the streams, rivers, lakes, but then also oceans, uh, huge areas of the ocean and also a lot of load of bacteria and parasites uh, that uh, cause disruption to those ecosystems as well. Uh, massive reservoirs of poop that come from factory farms, and that's a huge issue, okay. Climate change. Now, the United Nations in 2006 said 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions came from animal agriculture. They got their hands smacked by industries and governments who didn't like that because the animal agriculture industry is very powerful. And they, they kind of got in trouble and they did another paper and revised it to 14.5%, which a lot of people go for uh, or quote these days. That's from 2014. Um, and there's other people who calculate the number up to 51% when they include land use change and even the CO2 emissions from animals breathing, okay? Now, the truth is likely somewhere in between. It's calculated based, it depends on what you're including or excluding from your calculations, but it's probably higher than 14.5%, lower than 51%, but um, you have to be very careful and, and see what should and shouldn't be included in that calculation and excluding too many things that they get that lower number, right? Um, the gases that you get from animal agriculture are CO2. When you are def causing deforestation, uh, you get decomposition of the biomass releasing CO2, or you're burning the forests, right? That causes CO2 emissions, but also the uh, decomposing biomass uh, will also generate methane and nitrous oxide, as well as the poop from animals generating methane and nitrous oxide. And when ruminants ruminate, uh, they generate, they burp, and to some extent fart, but mostly burp, some methane at all times, okay? And, and that is a big part of the climate change gases. And ruminants, so cattle, sheep, and goat, cause the most amount of CO2 emissions. So here you can see in this slide that, that extensive, so pasture-raised, uh, ruminants, like in this case, uh, cattle meat or beef, uh, causes the highest amount of uh, emissions with some variation, okay? If you optimize it, you can get the number lower, okay? And then other beef systems that are intensive, like factory farms, will, will cause smaller amounts of emissions. Then you have other animals, but the most minuscule amount of emissions come from plant protein sources, pulses, beans, peas, soy, lentils, legumes. Uh, our world in data, again, puts it like this, showing again, you know, how the difference, the vast difference between uh, uh, plant-based foods versus animal foods are in greenhouse gas emissions, and also shows the variation. So if you really, really optimize um, the ruminant uh, production systems, you can get to fairly low levels at, at this end of the spectrum, but most producers are sitting sort of where these these other peaks are in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions from, in this case, uh, meat from uh, cattle, all right, beef, uh, or from lambs. Um, they are, you know, you get these peaks, but you get this range over here. If you optimize it, you can get to this lower level, but not too many people get down to that level, okay? 
we can see the same thing for different animals and how efficient they are. But you see the plant-based foods are super efficient. And if you do the plant-based foods in the most efficient way, you see tofu here getting almost close to zero efficiency emissions and beans and peas, if done the best ways, you can get negative emissions for a certain amount of time as well as nuts, okay? You, you plant nut trees everywhere. For a few years, you're sequestering carbon. You're really actually sequestering carbon into the soil. And that will plateau, um, but for some time you can have actually negative emissions, okay? And again, stated differently, the combined environmental impacts of, uh, in terms of climate change for, for what are the different components of climate change from all these different sources. Our world and data is a great uh, resource. You can go there and it's converted some really good papers, some very important papers into graphic format. Let's talk about fish and the oceans, all right? Now in 1950, people harvested about 20 million tons of fish from the oceans. But now it's a lot more. It's about uh, 140 million tons from the ocean and 60 million tons from aquaculture. So aquaculture has taken off as a huge um, uh, industry now. And it's not by any means environmentally friendly. All right. Um, there's also a lot of uh, a huge amount of uh, harvesting or taking of fish from the oceans through illegal, unregulated, undocumented, what they call IUU fishing. Okay. And that is very substantial as well. We take about uh, 0.8 to more than 2 trillion fish from the year, from the oceans per year. And again, for scale, that means 25,000 to 70,000 fish per second, all right? And it is uh, collectively the biggest cause of ecosystem destruction in the oceans, okay? 33% of marine fish or more by this time are sustainable, uh, sorry, are harvested at, um, with by sort of year by year, sort of shrinking the populations of fish in the oceans. And we're sort of wiping those um, populations out very fast. 60% are maximally fish, so they're still unsustainable. And only 7% of fishing occurs globally within levels that the populations of fish can sort of replace themselves. Farmed fish, as I mentioned, is not uh, eco-friendly. There's a lot of blue washing going on. And remember when you have these... Uh, ecosystem, sort of the eco certifications on these different fish. Oh, this is like a green fish or a yellow fish. There's an eco certification. Those certifications are essentially controlled by the industry, fishing industry themselves. They make their own um, eco certification up, monitor themselves, and it's a marketing tool for them that has very little scientific basis. And there's, there's not much um, um, really eco about what they're doing, all right? Um, there's no external monitoring of any of these things. Fish sentience, a lot of people consider that fish are you know, not sentient, they don't feel pain, but there's very good studies on fish cognition, memory, social interactions, pain experience, and emotional states. And when we look at fish, there are functional and total ex extinction. So um, a, a functional extinction means you've wiped out most of the population of a uh, species and it's not serving a role in the environment. It barely exists in the environment anymore uh, to, to play uh, a part. Uh, that it normally did, okay? Um, so sharks, whales, um, birds, mammals, and ocean life, every uh, ocean, all ocean life is caught in fishing nets. The biggest cause of the death of uh, whales and, you know, ocean birds and everything is, is fishing, right? There's no such thing as dolphin safe tuna. They just print that on the label. And bycatch uh, is, is what I was mentioning there is that, you know, we're killing everything in the oceans. And and, and whales and, uh, you know, they're still hunted. And there's kind of a military competition over the seas these days for um, uh, fishing resources. That's what people want as, as well as other, um, other things they wanna extract from the ocean. And when we talk about plastic in the ocean, there's a term, AD, uh, ALDFG, abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear. This is an actual term. And it makes up 20% of the plastic in the ocean. And there, uh, in some areas like the Great Pacific Gyre or Garbage Patch, it's 46% of the, of, the, of the plastic there. And it's the deadliest of plastics because, you know, these fishing industries, they just, when they have these, you know, nets which weigh thousands of kilograms and they're kind of old, it's a lot of work to haul them up onto the uh, ship and then bring them to land and dispose of them. That's expensive, time consuming, difficult. They just cut them off and leave them in the oceans, okay? And, and broken nets are everywhere in the ocean and they're killing wildlife 
wildlife in the ocean continually. And you have these advertisements you know, and movements to like ban straws. Like, why would you ban a straw and not ban the plastic cup? Um, that's already kind of um, not smart. And, you know, media and industry, uh, you know, collude to create fake solutions to make people feel like they're doing something by not using a straw while the real issues go on unabated. Now let's talk about hunting, all right? And now back, if you go back like 50,000, 3,000 years ago, there's something called the Quaternary Extinction Period where humans moved uh, from Africa to all parts of the planet and basically wiped out half of all, you know, uh, um, megafauna, that is large animal populations, where it's sort of cut in half, and many, many became extinct because humans basically hunted them. There was also some climate change and, and things going on as ecosystems did change during that time, but hunting is, is thought to be uh, combined with those issues and the sort of final insult to wipe out so many species. And then we sort of reached a period of stability where the, remain, the human population sort of matured into certain types of societies and became stable with uh, the remaining large animal populations. But humans like to kill the large animals, right? That's why uh, people would hunt the mammoth, right? They would, they would uh, get more satisfaction than you know, hunt, hunting a mouse, let's say, right? But um, we, we wiped out most of the world's megafauna. But currently, there's another rapid megafauna extinction going on. And our livestock numbers have increased greatly as well. So um, if we look at megafauna, uh, numbers, be, you know, before pre-human times were already six times lower than pre-human times. But now there are 362 megafauna species remaining on the earth and 70% of them are in severe decline and 60% pretty much are at risk of extinction, hunting being the biggest cause. When we have logging roads and cell phones, guns, fossil fuels, vehicles, everything that we do and habitat loss also is the second biggest cause, um, then we're going everywhere and hunting all these animals. And again, wherever we are, um, you know, we're, we're sort of wiping them out. Now, food security, how to feed this future population that we're going to have, which is really, really important, okay? So if we switched to completely plant-based foods overnight, okay, this is sort of, if we magically did this, using the existing land that we use for agriculture, we can feed at least an, another 4 billion people without using any additional land or any additional impact on um, ecosystems, okay, within our current land footprint, we can do this. Now, that doesn't mean that people will get the food that they need because we're not very good at sharing our resources with other people who need it more, but that's how much food we can make, all right? Um, so when people eat animals, this is also a food justice and food security issue, right? Because we are taking a lot of the earth's food, feeding it to animals, and it goes to the global rich and not as much goes to the global poor, okay? And we are diverting land, water, and all kinds of uh, resources that humans could use the global poor um, to those that are more uh, about uh, global rich. There's a lot of land grabbing, uh, for example, in the Amazon uh, displacing indigenous people uh, to burn forests um, and, and literally murdering them in many cases, killing them uh, to do this. And this is not just an, uh, an Amazon issue, it's happening in a lot of places as uh, richer countries take over land in more developing nations as well. Um, so there's a lot of land food uh, justice issues, okay? Bio biofuels pose the same problem, okay? Biofuels are also horrible, um, but uh, the impact is not as vast as for um, animal food production, okay? Um, Plant-based foods, um, would mean that you can grow more food, more protein, more calories on a very much smaller proportion of land, okay? Then all that extra land, all that huge amount of extra land, you can allow forests, wetlands, natural grasslands, and everything to grow back. And you can allow natural ecosystems to come back, natural animals to come back, okay? And this is what a truly regenerative agriculture means, okay? Rewilding the land is something that's badly necessary. Uh, or as we mentioned, growing more food on existing land to feed the future world population. And when we use conservation agriculture, right? So regenerative agriculture, which the meat industry is boasting about so much, but kind of not really telling the truth, um, we can use the best practices to grow plant-based agriculture because not all plant-based agriculture is done sustainably. We can improve those practices and also include a lot of food justice practices as well and have a, a better plant agriculture. 
All right. So some things that are the superstars of the world's food production, and that is uh, for protein, we love pulses, okay? Pulses means beans, legumes, soy, all these uh, amazing uh, varieties of um, foods. They are high in protein. They're amazing for your health. They can sequester carbon, at least for a few decades of growth, if done right, okay? Um, and are very, very uh, low carbon intensive, low land intensive. They can grow almost anywhere on earth, all right? And as I mentioned, they're very high in protein and soy is the highest in protein and they help bring nitrogen from the air into the ground. So when you're growing other crops um, uh, alongside of them, they help fertilize the other crops without chemical uh, fertilizer uh, application because they're bringing nitrogen, okay? Uh, the United Nations recognizes this. When we look at North America, throughout North America, indigenous peoples through most of North America, you know, not in the furthest sort of North where you didn't have as much farming, but uh, through southern portions of Canada, throughout the US and um, uh, Latin America, Mesoamerica, South America, um, people grew different varieties of beans, corn, and squash together. They even did this in Ontario, where I, I learned this year. And that provides a very, very complete nutrition for protein, vitamin A, and so many other nutrients, and they, and they support each other's growth. So this is a very interesting indigenous wisdom. And other parts of the world as well, where people were doing this for a long time. Okay, Canada's new food guide does recommend more plant-based foods. Okay, choosing whole grains and um, plant-based proteins and a smaller proportion of animal-based proteins for health. Okay, and lots of fruits and vegetables for improving our health and uh, environment. Okay, and um, that. Uh, um, uh, if, you, if we look at the sort of, if you look at the Eat Lancet, okay, the Lancet, when they talk about a global sort of planetary diet uh, that can feed 10 billion people in 2050, they're even more plant-based than the Canada Food Guide and uh, an even more sophisticated um, nutrition guide uh, is the Eat Lancet. So it's an it's a international team creating that, not just from one country. Okay, so um, check out the Eat Lancet and note that the major uh, medical organizations are recognizing more and more that as we shift to whole food plant-based, okay, I'm not recommending junk foods here, okay, for plant-based foods, um, uh, we can decrease cancer, cardiovascular disease, and improve human health from other parameters as well. And uh, at the same time, uh, decrease the ecological impact. So remember pulses and whole grains, fruits and vegetables, food groups. Remember that food waste is also a problem. Biofuels are also a problem. And food justice is also a problem, okay? We wanna make sure that our food system is more fair. Eat the rainbow for human health. These are all the different plant-based food groups, okay? That for whole food, plant-based. And um, we also wanna remember that some plant-based foods, if we're eating too much oils, especially things like palm oil, um, Things that when we're eating them, they have no nutritional purpose. Like I used to love ramen noodles, but we've cut that back significantly, like to almost zero because of the palm oil and things like that in there. Avocados can have a very heavy environmental impact when they come from certain parts of Mexico and they're, you know, and, and so forth. Foods transported on airplanes, the packaging of, of plant-based foods and other foods that we eat that are not necessary are causing eco impact without giving us any nutritional benefits. So it's a waste, okay? So remember all these things together. Let's get our diets more healthy. We will benefit, we'll be better representatives of plant-based diet and what they can do for health and uh, also have a lower ecological impact. Look at human rights as well. Uh, check out this website, foodispower.org. And um, there's a lot of human rights abuses in the chocolate industry. So really try to buy non-slave chocolate, okay? Bananas, buy organic bananas because it's actually better for the workers on the plantations. And there's other work, worker rights issues as well. Um, remember that pandemics are a direct result of animal agriculture, COVID-19, MERS, SARS, swine flu, HIV, Ebola, Spanish flu, all of these are examples that come from animal agriculture, mass animal agriculture, and then affect humans, okay? Check out this podcast that I've done as well. It's online. Dristi, I'm almost finished here. Sorry about taking so much time. And, um, and uh, learn about that. And uh, remember that, you know, there's compassion towards humans, towards animals and the environment. It's, it's a combined issue, all right? These guys knew it. That's why they went plant-based or vegetarian. And, um, and it's a, it's a great thing for the future, okay? So uh, I guess in concluding that, uh, you know, plant-based uh, foods are, a plant-based diet is fundamental to sustainability and on par with the biggest uh, environmental um, 
insults that we're doing as humans. Okay, remember, as a you know, as a plant based person or as a vegan, doesn't mean that oh, I can buy a big heart house or a big car or anything like that or fly around the world because I've offset my carbon. That's not true. We have to look at the rest of our material footprints as well. And I'll combine this issue with the other social justice movements for you know, for, um, the global poor, women's rights, you know. LGBTQ, every kind of rights uh, imaginable, and um, economics, governance, war and peace industry, overconsumption in general, these things are all viewed together uh, with our diet as well. So let's um, uh, look at them together. Shout out to Greta, because uh, she's one of the people who looks at it this way. My website again, and um, yeah, check out plant-based diet. I'm going to stop here my screen share, all right, so that we can get to questions. I think I went uh, a little bit too long, but... Uh, but we still have some time here. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think you're good with time. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. If anyone, Great. If anyone has any questions, you can, um, you know, you can unmute and say it, or you can put put it in the chat. I know some of the people in the chat were asking um, about the copy of the presentation. Um, one, like this is going to be recorded, and we'll post it as well as um, I'm sure, like Tushar can like send. Yeah, I can, I can send you the slides. Great. And then someone else was asking about the name of the podcast, I think. Oh, yeah, I think it's in the chat. Um, it's called uh, Understanding, they, they titled it Understanding Pandemics Like COVID-19 with Dr. Tushar Mehta. Okay. And uh, Dr. Michael Greger, um, people may know about him. He has a fantastic book about um, pandemics from animal agriculture, as well as a set of um, video podcasts that are really great. But um, uh, that podcast there I hope you will also enjoy it sort of covers the, uh, the topic most of the topic I think um, Morgan has a question um yeah so I just want to ask um this is kind of coming from my brother who's not vegan and the biggest pushback that I get back from him on environmental issues specifically is regarding soil and my understanding is I haven't done a lot of research on this, but I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about um, like what I generally tend to hear is that like cow manure is, is like necessary to provide proper nutrients to the soil. If we only um, grow grain or soy or whatever, it's not going to be conducive to long term soil health, which will ultimately be bad for agriculture and providing food to people who need it. So I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, so uh, refer him to the article. Um, I mentioned in the presentation, okay, where we do an analysis of this issue, okay. The animal agriculture industry provides this very sort of lovely picture story where, you know, you grow animals, you have animals roaming around, they fertilize the soil with their poop, and um, that will store carbon in the ground, and, you know, you are going to have, you have these lovely pictures of fields with a few cows on it. It's, it's, it's totally bogus, right? If you have those huge fields with a few cows on it, you will feed like 0.01% of the world's population while using, you know, like a, a tiny, tiny fragment. Of it. Just I'm using pulling that number out of the hat, you know, but a tiny fragment of the world's population using so much land, it's not even possible to supply the amount of protein through the amount of land that grazing takes. Remember, grazing globally feeds uses about. Um, 20, uh, more than 20%, uh, 20 to 30% of the global land use, okay, is from grazing. And it only provides 1.2% of global protein. When those pictures are used by animal agriculture industry and they make those movies like Kiss the Ground, they love to show these pictures of green fields with a few cows. You're not gonna feed that many people with that. You're not even gonna feed 1% of society because most grazing operations actually have far more animals than that. And that's why it has a very large impact. When you're trying to do re so-called regenerative grazing, one of the major things that you have to do is reduce the number of animals. And of course, you have to move them around so they're not eating from one place too long. So you move the around, around the animals and you have less number of animals, and then you're gonna do less damage to the soil, right? But it's not true really that they're um, storing carbon in the soil. And the other thing is that, where do those nutrients come from? The nutrients in the poop, only come from the food that is eaten by the animal. So if you're eating on the land and pooping on the same land, you've created no new nutrients. You've created more methane. You get nitrous oxide that is emitted, which loses some of the net nitrogen that is collected there. But um, uh, 
regenerative, you know, best grazing practices uh, are just to have less animals. They move the animals around and they use a lot of cover crops, especially leguminous cover crops like clover. And it's all the plants that actually, you know, that uh, keep the soil intact and maybe store some carbon in the soil. But the animal can be removed from the picture and the plants alone would do even a better job. Okay, but they're just sort of telling the story the way they want to, so they can try to promote this idea of uh, grass fed uh, animals. And at the same time now, McDonald's and A&W and all these guys are advertising the grass fed beef. So the industry comes up with these studies, you know, that are kind of gamed and they promote all these stuff. They create these movies. And then the big animal agriculture players like McDonald's and A&W and everybody else starts promoting grass fed beef products and causes confusion. So one of the biggest things that whether it's the oil industry or the smoking industry or other mega players do is that they create confusion in the environmental space and uh, they promote different ideas, competing ideas that are, can be completely false, but um, sway some people, confuse others, and that's their strategy. So I, I really recommend that you take a look at the article that we wrote. Um, and not only that, but if you really want to study it, look at the references that we provide in the article, okay? You have to read all the references to really know what you're talking about uh, and not just believe like some movie or something like that. I hope that helps. <laughs> but it's, it's big because it's not just your brother. This is the biggest marketing push by the um, meat and dairy industry worldwide currently. They're spending millions and millions of dollars making these movies, writing these books, funding these studies, um, promoting these advertisements. I just live, I live in Brampton and like, like just on my way to work, there's a, a McDonald's and we're using sustainable beef advertise. You know, there's no coincidence that Kiss the Ground comes out in 2020. In 2021, these guys are advertising, you know, uh, and McDonald's is advertising regenerative uh, sort of, uh, you know, sustainable beef. It's all sort of one big, you know, marketing strategy. So uh, this was just kind of going off of Morgan's question, but talking about like the greenwashing tactics by meat and dairy industries, right. I was wondering, because I know even um, there's some like affiliations with government groups and the meat and dairy industry where they receive funding and things like that. So I was wondering if there's any regulation on like sort of limiting the ability of meat and dairy industries to set their own regulations because that just didn't really make sense to me how they could do that. I know what you're doing. But you, I, I sort of get the drift of what you're saying. Um, but for decades, for decades, the meat and dairy industry and all large industries, the, you know, the biggest and most powerful industries that sort of, they have a lot of influence on government. They have a huge amount of lobbying power. Um, people from these rich industries are more likely to get into government. Look at our government leaders in Canada, they're coming from rich industrial families themselves who become, you know, the, uh, our, our prime ministers and uh, many of our elected officials. They come from these industries or they're, they're family members with these industries. They work with these industries and they get paid by these industries. Okay. I hate to say it, but our elected officials do favors to industry while they're elected. And then after um, they're out of office, they become on the board of directors, join these industries, their family members become uh, uh, parts of these industries as well and are handsomely, handsomely report, rewarded. And I, I also believe there's a lot of money that just changes hands as well, which you know, we're not necessarily aware of. But in that way, it's a global problem, including Canada, where industry has um, uh, a really big uh, influence on government. And that includes the animal in uh, agriculture industry. In Canada, uh, you know, just maybe whatever, 20 years ago, it used to be illegal to put B12, calcium, or vitamin D into soy milk, right? The animal agriculture industry a long time ago recognized that soy is like a, this is a big competition for us. So they lobbied the government and they made it illegal to supplement soy milk. Now, people challenged that or the, you know, maybe, um, let, you know, um, people within the sort of bureaucracy of the government at some point realized that this is not a good thing. And then they, maybe about 20 years back, they allowed soy milk to be supplemented. So then we have supple, you know, soy milk that has calcium, vitamin D, B12 and everything in that. But they, these are strategies they thought of a long time ago to, you know, to give problems. And right now there's a lot of laws and lobbying by uh, animal agriculture industry, including ag gag laws and all kinds of things to stop people from sort of, um, uh, blowing the whistle as to 
what happens in factory farms, etc. Um, and just for decades, there's there's uh, relationships on multiple levels and huge amounts of subsidies and everything like that. It's very very complicated. Okay, so um, uh, th there's um, a lot of these sort of contradictions and, and kind of corruptions that go on in 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 this industry as well as others. I think there's a question in the chat as well. Um, can you are you able okay. to? Uh, uh, why the people are not following the Canada's food guide. I think that people, people are very, very heterogeneous. You can, um, people create this Canada food guide, but then people are still stuck in their old ways, right? All people don't want to think about these things. They don't, you know, they are, um, um, very bonded to their way of life, culture, thinking, etc. And it's hard to change that. So I think you can come up with a new food guide and not everybody's going to follow it right away, right? Like you can show this food guide to your parents. Does that mean your parents are going to switch necessarily or your friends are going to switch right away? Humans are difficult and we're complicated. So we have to work together in terms of how to um, uh, change our behaviors, right? Um, and, and that includes institutions as well. And, and yes, Nation Rising. There's Nation Rising is a fantastic organization. Um, and, and they are... Uh, a really a group of you know professors and academics and uh, you know other uh, you know super smart people who are together trying to influence legislation um, and um, economic policies subsidies and so forth um, in Canada so that's a great organization also you should check out Animal Justice Canada which is trying to fight some of these ag gag laws that are put in place by uh, that are being put in place by governments. Uh, through industry influence, as well as even challenge some of the advertising that industry does, which it, we know is not true. So there are, um, that's another organization to look out, look out for as well. Could you please kind of re-explain what you meant by like, there's no dolphin safe tuna? Like what exactly that means? Have you guys heard of dolphin safe tuna? Have you heard of that? Yeah. Right, so you get a can, right? You get a can of tuna, or in the story you can see a can of tuna and it says dolphin safe on that, okay? so. Dolphins are, uh, people were more aware of, of this a while ago. I'm not sure how big it is. You know, these things come and go from the media, but um, these fishing nets are wiping out dolphins um, as they get caught in nets throughout the ocean, right? And so people were like, oh my God, like, you know, my fishing, uh, my fish foods are, are gonna kill dolphins. So then some companies started saying, oh, we're gonna use different nets or something like that. And our nets are going to be safe for dolphins. So we'll catch the fish, but the dolphins won't get caught. It was just a complete fabrication. And they may have tweaked a couple of things, probably didn't make any difference at all, but at least they said that they could, they did something and we're still killing dolphins, whales, and everything in the ocean, sea turtles, um, aquatic birds, um, seahorses, you name it, dragging, you know, trawlers drag along the ocean floor and disrupt the ocean floor, which is a very important part of the marine ecosystem as well and completely disrupt the ocean floor as well as they trawl and drag for sea life down there but um it's just something they write on the can there's no legislation no standards no nothing it's just something they write on the can to say they're dolphin safe while not really doing anything better for dolphins at all and it helps them sell more tuna makes you feel good <laughs> It's very interesting. Mitsubishi is uh, one of the biggest. Um, um, I, I did a, a mission with an organization called Sea Shepherd, where I, I spent uh, time on their ships, and we went to the Antarctic. And it was a mission about uh, sort of an annual thing that one of um, one of their annual projects, where you're sort of challenging these um, um, whale hunters from Japan, and we're poaching in the Southern Ocean. And I learned a lot while I was there about ocean life. Um, but uh, in terms of bluefin tuna, that's kind of the most um, fancy tuna that people want to eat. Um, Mitsubishi, the company, uh, which is a big multinational company, is has um, a, a big, uh, I guess, aquatic food section. And, and they're basically buying up all as much bluefin tuna as they can and, and, and uh, sort of uh, driving a sort of economic force to uh, drive the fishing of bluefin tuna. Uh, worldwide till the point where it's going to go extinct. Bluefin tuna are going to go extinct. And they are collecting all these tuna, freezing them in massive, massive, massive freezers. So they have this huge supply of bluefin tuna. And when it becomes extinct, 
they'll be able to serve you meat from an extinct species at this super high price. Like, you know, we'll give you like whatever thousand dollars per serving at fancy restaurants or something like that, right? They just stand to make this enormous amount of money by um, eventually serving you an extinct species. It's it, like those kind of things are actually going on. I was actually gonna ask about, um, I know like through your experience with plant-based data, um, you probably have to go through like, you know, thousands of articles and things like that. Is there any, I guess, key things to look out for when, um, in terms of like analyzing good papers from bad papers or anything like that? Very good question. So uh, first of all, I want to um, just, uh, remind you guys to come and check out plant-based data. Now it's a very nerdy website, okay? It's what you'll find on that website, you'll find sort of a nutrition section, a uh, environment section, zoonosis section, an economic section. That's what we have so far mainly, okay? Now in our biggest sections, that's the health and the environment section. What we have is we have a couple of user-friendly things. There's a video in each section that, uh, or a podcast that you can take a look at. This gives you a good overview uh, of uh, some of these things. Okay, this talk that I've just given to you, I have a much smoother version of this talk that I, I gave um, about a year and a half ago, and um, it's a good recording of it. So you can share that with your friends. And um, but then we have our summaries of key articles. So we take them, I, I've literally gone through thousands of articles myself just over the past about uh, nine, 10 years. And, and, and then we've organized them. So it's organized into a database with just folders. It's kind of a, you're looking at my Google Drive when you look at that database, you're looking at my Google Drive and Nick, Nick's Google Drive, we have a shared Google Drive. You're looking right into our computers basically. So it's not fancy, but you're looking right at, right at uh, what we see on our computers and all the different org articles are organized in different drives. But then there's also a summary of key articles, which is a little bit easier to use. You can click on the summary and takes the most important articles and you can sort of search by the term. You can look at the term dairy or climate or whatever you want and search the articles that have what you're looking for in there. Okay. So it's, it's not a fancy website, but there's a lot in there if you use it properly. So go to the website and just click the summary of key articles. Okay, that's a good way to start. And um, you can scroll through the articles and see how much data there actually is. People, like scientists worldwide, have been studying these issues for a long time. But people don't know about them because we're in a data overloaded world and most people don't look under the covers to see how much information there is. So there's, there's, when I started looking at these things, I was surprised at how much research that already existed. And the amount of research coming out is just faster and faster now uh, that more and more people are, are researching but there's a, a big gap between the research and getting the word out to the public right and for people's understanding because the animal agriculture industries actually have much more influence as to what comes on your tv and netflix and the researchers are sort of nerdy people you know in in, in their offices and uh that don't have a lot of money to spread the word now your question, Dristi, what do you look for for quality articles? You look at how the article was conducted, um, how uh, in line it is with other good quality articles, um, and the methodology should be logical and understandable. The um, uh, You have to look at inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, you have to see if they've con they're considering all the different factors that could affect the um, uh, the observed variables they're trying to, um, that they're considering in their study, um, and, and so many different ways you can consider it. But the, the summaries list will, will give you a lot of that. You also look at funding, and you look, at, look, at, look for methodological flaws. So um, you look at industry-funded articles, you don't just write them off, say, oh, I don't like this um, article because it's industry-funded, but you look deeply at the methodology and see if the methodology makes sense uh, and how applicable it is to uh, real situations, right? That's what we do. And the best, um, you know, and so, and so you, we look at research data, but we also look at institutional data, like UN, UN, United Nations data and other large organizations amalgamating data. It doesn't mean that they're always doing it perfectly. And even organizations like the United Nations are very mixed. So one group of people from the United Nations may come up with a conclusion, and then another group of people from the United Nations writes on the same topic and has a slightly different conclusion. But you have to look at both of them and the data that they include and exclude and the conclusions that they have and try to look at them together and try to make sense of them together. So that's why why um, I, I rarely give 
a number, just a single number about anything, I give a range depending on what the best research shows, um, you know, and, 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 and give you that sort of range in, in terms of a lot of things whenever I'm speaking. Okay, thanks. Hey, Tushar. Hey, Radhika. Um, I was wondering if you can uh, speak to soy from that, like a lot of people are afraid of soy right. because of the, what's put out there and they're afraid of almonds because of the environmental right. impact. Right. And so those are the two things that I hear from non-vegans sometimes. Right, right. Well, I'm a big um, fan of soy foods actually, okay? Soy foods are super ecological super ecological because you can grow so much protein with such a small footprint, such a small footprint. I mean, people are criticizing soy. Well, I mean, your animals are fed soy and you're just accumulating all the soy that they're eating anyways. That's another thing. But people criticize soy for various reasons. They, one of the main criticisms, they say, well, there's estrogen in soy. So soy contains isoflavones. Now, isoflavones are a group of compounds that have, a, you know, amongst other things, one of their properties is they have a tiny, tiny estrogen effect, tiny, tiny pro-estrogen effect, but it's a very, very, very small effect, like one out of a thousand, sort of one out of a hundred or one one hundredth the effect or one one thousandth the effect of a real animal estrogen in your body. So if there's estrogen, you know, even males have a tiny bit of estrogen, that estrogen molecule has a certain effect and a soy isoflavone may, may have one one hundredth or one one thousandth that effect depending on which estrogen you compare it to and the receptor of the estrogen in the body. So it's a very tiny effect, but it also has an estrogen blocking effect. So if you have a, a estrogen receptor and an estrogen re fits into that receptor and causes a, a, an effect in the cell, let's say you have an isoflavone, which sort of fits in, but not completely, it's actually maybe fits in like 100 times to eventually cause an estrogen effect. But then a real estrogen comes along and it's being blocked by this thing that's already there. So it modifies the estrogen in your body by having a blocking effect as well as a slight estrogen effect. And what we call that is a selective estrogen receptor modifier or a CIRM, okay? And the way that soy actually may have some of its health benefits is that it blocks some of the types of estrogen or some of the receptors that actually promote cancer uh, while stimulating a little bit preferentially some of those receptors, which may cause, let's say, bone strengthening, okay? But it doesn't have any real strong estrogen effect per se, okay? It doesn't, it, it's found to decrease breast cancer. If you consume soy throughout your life, you have lower rates of breast, breast cancer. If somebody has had breast cancer, if they're a survivor, there's good evidence to show that people consuming soy foods after a diagnosis have a slight, you know, a 20, 30% reduce risk of recurrence when you're going three to five years out, okay? That doesn't mean it's a for lifetime prevention, but there's some preventive effect, what we call secondary prevention. And for men who consume soy, there's no effect on their testosterone levels or muscle mass gain or anything like that. But throughout their life, later on, you have a reduction, like, a, like a, somewhere between 25 to 40% reduction, again, that range of decreased prostate cancer. And that's the most important cancer in men. Okay, so there's no disadvantage eco, um, ecologically or nutritionally, but it has a, uh, you know, definite advantages in both realms. But the meat and dairy industry for decades have been saying, oh, this gives you estrogen, you'll get boobs and you'll get all kinds of things, but it's not true. On the other hand, if you eat the flesh of a female animal, the animal contains real animal estrogen, which has a 100% effect in your body and maybe one of the reasons why animal-based foods increase the amount of breast cancer that women get, actually get, right? This is, this is real numbers. Um, and also um, milk uh, and dairy products contain the highest amount of estrogen because cows or a mammal, when she is lactating, has estrogen in the milk. But the cow is, uh, you, know, she, you know, when she's lactating, she's also impregnated again after three months. And then the estrogen levels go even much, much higher. So dairy is the highest uh, um, product of any kind of estrogen. Eggs contain estrogen. They grow in the female body of a chicken and they contain estrogen too, real estrogen. So the real problem with estrogen consumption comes from meat, dairy, and eggs. And isoflavones have mostly an estrogen kind of modifying or blocking effect and they are not shown to have any real estrogen effect aside from maybe strengthening your bones and maybe they do help with menopausal symptoms, 
but it's not much of a strong estrogen effect by any stretch. And um, you're not gonna grow man boobs. There are other criticisms of soy, like there's what, well, oh, there's GMO soy. Well, most GMO soy is fed to animals. Like in fact, humans can consume less than 6% of the soy grown on earth. The rest is used for biofuels and, and mostly really for animal feed, okay? And that's why it's not sustainable. That's why you're wiping out the Amazon. It's because you're creating animal feed. There's that feed conversion ratio. As I mentioned, they're gonna eat a lot of soy and you're gonna get a small amount of protein back, right? Whereas when humans consume soy, we mostly consume organic soy, like soy milk. I drink silk soy milk. I just happen to like that one. It's organic. So um, it's organic, uh, it's non-GMO. But even if you are consuming GMO soy, why is GMO soy any worse than GMO wheat or GMO tomato or your GMO chicken or GMO beef or GMO um, pigs? They're all GMO. And why is soy worse than any of those? There's no explanation. It's just the anti-marketing done by meat and dairy industry, which everybody picks up on. It becomes kind of like this normal idea people have uh, just based on fake news, right? And, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I suggest, I don't tell people to take, consume food from any particular single source all the time. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that soy is one of the, uh, one of the most fantastic foods out there. It is a superfood ecologically. It is a superfood for in terms of bone strength, reduction of cholesterol, and reduction of breast and prostate cancer, as I already mentioned. So it has a lot of good properties, but a lot of the other lentils and beans probably do too. Um, and they're also like superfoods. Um, but soy is a great one. So I think, you know, having soy in a minimally processed way is better. Uh, so soy milk and tofu and uh, tempeh and all those things are great as well as whole soybeans, edamame and, and stuff is fantastic. My wife is Chinese. When they eat tofu in China, they eat like a block of tofu, you know, like it, it, they, they eat a lot. So, um, and, and people drink soy milk there all the time. Um, you know, it's, um, but that's not the reason to, to, to consume it. I'm taught, that's not a scientific thing. That's a cultural thing, okay? Scientifically, the data is very good. Um, and it's, it is very sustainable. And when you use conservation agriculture, then it's fantastic. So having, uh, you know, I, I, the best and most sustainable plant-based milk, you'll see all kinds of stuff online and they say, oh, maybe it's oat milk and all that stuff. There's just a bias against soy. Soy is the most sustainable plant-based milk. Because if you're eating more plant-based and people, let's say, were formerly animal, eating animal foods, you can't replace your milk with, with, uh, with almond milk. Almond milk is essentially white water. It's got a gram of protein in a glass. What you should be doing is drinking like soy milk that contains like seven grams of protein per, per glass, right, per 250 mil. That's the proper replacement, not almond milk, okay? So almond milk tastes great and everything like that. Um, it probably has lesser of an environmental impact than animal-based foods. But if you look at on a pro, per protein, uh, per gram of protein, it, 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 it has a high impact, environmental impact, okay? So I, I prefer people to not eat so many uh, almonds because there are environmental impacts in terms of water use, in terms of um, uh, bee populations that are disproportionate to other plant-based foods, okay? May not be as bad as a lot of animal foods, but it's certainly um, worse than a lot of plant-based foods. So let's go for the soy milk and soy-based foods. And we can eat almonds, but just not all the time, okay? Because we have to think about, you know, if billions of people are eating almonds, if you scale it um, in, in a food justice manner, you know, how um, resource intensive is this thing? So um, I would say that eat some almonds, you can, but limit the amount. Soy milk is the most sustainable, followed by let's say pea milk and uh, some other um, high protein plant milks are, are out there now too. They're pretty sustainable. And uh, oat milk uh, is usually has two grams of protein. So it's not a true replacement from a protein fashion. Um, and there's this myth out there. A lot of people say, oh, some, a, lot, a lot of people think, oh, you can't get protein if you're a vegan. That's not true. You can get lots of protein. And there's other people who say, oh, just eat lots of foods and you'll get enough protein as a vegan. That's not true either, okay? Because a lot of people I see eating um, vegan diets that are, or plant-based diets that don't make sense. And they're actually very low in protein or very high in junk foods or whatever it might be. So uh, humans are all over the map, okay? We need to not be dogmatic about these things, be a little bit um, conscious about our diet. And, and, and make sure you're getting, like, let's say, a one gram of protein per gram of healthy body weight per day, 
okay? That's kind of the amount of protein you need. Get that much, okay? Don't overdo it. You don't need to um, for most of us and don't underdo it as well. Don't underappreciate it as well. Okay. So I hope that's a, that's a long answer, but I, I'm a big promoter of soy milk. I think that also the great thing about soy milk is it's an easy way to get your calcium, right? To have two, three glasses a day, you've got your calcium, plus eat other calcium-based foods as well uh, from the plant-based world and mix it up, eat lots of other beans and lentils too. Don't just have soy, but I think soy milk is, is fantastic as, as well as a lot of other soy foods. Another long answer, but I hope you covered a lot of the points that are worthwhile. Okay, I don't think. Oh, is there another question? I have one more question. Okay. Um, it's kind of, this is more like nutrition related. Um, so, okay, so I've, I'm like have, recovering from like my fifth concussion, and my neurologist says that because I'm plant based, um, my recovery time is going to be a lot longer because you apparently need um, animal fats to create neuroplasticity in the brain. I was wondering if you knew anything about that or. Do you have any counter arguments? Uh, well, I, I'm going to maybe, well, Linda Plowright is here too. So she might have a few things to say as well. But um, concussion is a complicated type of industry, uh, sorry, injury, okay? Um, and I don't think your neurologist is quoting studies that we have from the scientific literature, or even if there is a single study or a couple of small studies, that's not reliable. You want to look at bigger studies and, and, and larger involving larger groups of people and look at the different uh, variables included in the studies as well. But I don't think that is that makes sense from the scientific literature. I think that's more of a biased opinion. People do believe or, or that omega-3s are a part of um, our brain development and part of the healthy fats that we consume for our uh, brain development and, um, and um, ongoing health. But there's a lot of variability in the scientific literature when it comes to this, okay? So maybe it does play a role. And people sort of think that, okay, fish is the main source of omega-3s. But first of all, there's not good studies showing the superiority of um, long chain omega-3s over short chain, sort of the, um, the plant-based versus the animal uh, sort of ocean-based, I was going to say ocean-based omega-3s. There's not great studies on that because the, the plant-based omega-3s are not studied enough. Um, but there's a fantastic amount of plant-based omega-3s out there. If you're eating flax seeds and, and walnuts and all kinds of um, other plant-based foods like canola oil, if you use canola oil, olive oil, soybean oil, they contain lots of uh, plant-based omega-3s. You can look at it, Google it and find the, the heavy hitters in that department. And your body will convert the amount that it needs usually, okay? Your body converts that stuff um, um, in, in, in terms of many different nutrients. Your body knows how much it needs, takes the precursor and then converts the amount that it needs. But if let's say hypothetically, the long chain omega-3s were truly better, okay? Then they come from the ocean. And people use fish as the example of, okay, this is long chain, you know, um, EPA and DHA. But fish is the most toxic food. Fish is full of heavy metals, PCBs, furans, dioxins, and it's no, by no means sustainable. But where do fish get their omega-3s from? They get it from algae. The fish eat algae. That's how they get the omega-3 in the first place. So if you really want to get the cleanest source and most ecological source of long chain omega-3s, and let's say your neurologist is right, then you get algae oil, okay? And that is toxin-free. That's the only toxin-free source of omega-3s that you can really get because they, they, they brew the algae just like you brew beer or something like that in clean water. And they get the omega-3s pure and it's the same omega-3 that would be in the fish. And uh, you can get plant-based omega-3s and it's sustainable. Um, it's good for fish because you're not killing fish. It's good for the environment and it's better for you if uh, indeed that this is important. So I would just say, take the plant-based omega-3s from algae in that case. Long answer again, sorry about that, but um, cover sort of the evidence. And hypothetically, if, if that is true, and, you know, then, then go for the plant-based, um, sort of the algae omega-3. That's the best source by far, toxin-free. You don't need PCC, PCBs in your body, right? So, uh, you know, methylmercury or all the other junk. Anyways, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone um, for coming and uh, for showing up. And hopefully we all learn something to take away with us. And a big thank you to uh, Dr. Tushar Mehta for sharing such valuable knowledge. And we really, really appreciate it.
Okay, thank you guys. Please do check out a well-fed world, the website, okay? And check out plant-based data as well and some of the links there. Just play around with the website and, uh, and go to different parts, go, especially go to the summaries and, and uh, hopefully see our article about regenerative grazing, which we recently put a lot of work into. <laughs> and, and, uh, and feel free to tear it apart, go through the references on that as well, okay? And share that as well. Thank you guys. And good luck to all the things you're doing. I love speaking to students. And one of the things I, I, I also love to say to people is, that, you know, I, you know, I was university in one university once upon a time. And I remember I was surrounded by people who are very idealistic and wanted to change the world. And I sort of see um, as time goes on, people lose their ideals, you know, and, and as they get sort of, you know, older and older and, and um, sort of life changes. But um, remember all the practical things in life that you're going to be interested in when you graduate and, and um, to, to get a job and raise a family and do all the things practically, but don't lose your ideals at the same time. I think that's the, 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 the kind of parting message I love to give to younger people, you know, keep them both at the same time. I think it's hard because it's hard to live in the conventional world while having ideals, because a lot of times the things that we're participating in or things that benefit us personally are not benefiting the planet around us. And there's a cognitive kind of dissonance around that, right? But try to maintain and merge those things and try to keep that in your life and share that with other people because there's, you know, plant-based diet is definitely important, but even more important, uh, none of this will happen unless we have a, um, a group of humans on the planet that, you know, like together, we all work together and, and uh, care about each other and care about the planet around us, care about animals, whatever, you know, these are, these are things that have to be taken uh, together. So as students continue learning about everything that you're learning about and, um, and continue to hopefully throughout your life and you merge your ideals and your, and your good thoughts um, with the practical world around you as well. And uh, let's all continue working together. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye guys. Thank you very much for the invitation. Bye.